a scion of many worlds. The first week after getting back into contact with the Dauntless and properly swearing himself back in as an undaunted was both hectic and slow. Things did not move fast in medieval societies, even with bullshit magic to help facilitate communication. The Order of the Star Seekers moved relatively quickly in allying themselves with the Undaunted as they used his beacon radio more than he did. They were so full of questions and the limitations of the device being audio only had made things into a fascinating game of almost broken telephone. The lack of a visual aid and the lack of ground-level information allowed for the most hilarious misinterpretations he's seen. The concept of the fourth state of matter plasma, healing comas, non-Euclidean geometry, and other such advanced concepts was just one hilarious bit of entertainment. Horace had only needed to see the picture of a star and observe a plasma gun go off to really get it. The explanation of exactly what Null was and what it did had been another winner as had the idea that most people of the galaxy live a few hundred years instead of under a hundred. They'd even managed to get a few doctors and some mathematicians in to really blow the minds of the local scholars. He had officially been sworn in as the martial master of the star seekers. He also had a promotion upcoming once there was official contact between Lacran and the Undaunted. The ceremony itself had been small to the point of parody. Apparently, tradition had the entire branch that someone was being made the master of attend. In this case, that was no one, but his friends in the form of Magrika and his recruits were able to be there. First thing he did was swear in his girls as warriors of the stars, the official title for the Order's martial branch. Very fancy. The official uniform was a long cape in black with numerous little shocks of white to simulate the stars in the sky. Magrika had had a good laugh at the fact that hers was so large in comparison that she was able to tie off the ends on branches and turn it into a little hammock. Thankfully, the capes were thin, and the brooch that kept it all on was easily unclasped. The whole thing was made to come off easily so it couldn't be used to limit him. It also didn't interfere with his wings as it was also made for winged races like the Saramali. Although he was literally the first Urthani to ever wear the star cape, the name made it sound more impressive than it was. It was cloth woven from a naturally black fibrous plant that also had little bits of white cloth sewed on. Of course, the grand midwives hadn't been happy. Lady Aylure had woken up and there was drama about the consequences before being presented with the radio and speaking with it a bit. She had then pulled out some kind of orb to consult with the heads of her order. She had then been recalled and Jasper had focused on training up his recruits a little more as he improved his own abilities and physicality as much as possible. His goal was the rest of the bandit clan the girls were once part of. Get them on board and just like that, the Order of the Star Seekers has a small army, albeit a low quality one. He had questioned them about everything about the bandit clan as he had trained them, making sure to get a crystal clear idea of how it all went down. The whole thing was a massive band of disorganized and disaffected thugs. They had been ripped from their homes and forced to the opposite side of the kingdom and then thrown away minutes into the training when plans changed. They were pissed off, directionless, and hungry. They had no survival skills, no organization, no drills to stay strong, and half the time didn't even bother purifying the water they drank from leading to the numbers always being pared down by some poor woman getting the shits and passing on. They were down a full tenth of their number and mobile by pure necessity, as they were about as easy on the environment as a pyromaniac, and things just weren't getting better. The plan was nice and easy. Show up, offer carrot and stick, take control and whip them into shape. One of the main reasons the girls had stuck with him so readily was that he got them all fed and fixed up their stuff. The carrot he offered may as well had been an entire buffet table for how shit their lives had been. He was going to deal with all of that once he took control of the clan. 
Get them to start eating better, hunting smarter, foraging more skillfully, and actually boiling their damn water before drinking it so they stop dying of dysentery or whatever's killing them. Then, when that's done, he'll get them actually training with their stolen weapons until they're something more than a joke. The final polish of this first level of training was over. It was time to move. They had almost been attacked before they were recognized. All it took was some armor and their weapons being in good condition to make them completely unrecognizable. They also had come to a compromise with armored skirts rather than the greaves and pants that Jasper really liked. Couple that with solid breastplates and strong helmets, and he had them geared up in what he called Roman style. He had also gotten them each a spear, a massive shield, and a small sword. Unfortunately, they couldn't bring their new toys in as their repaired ones were already at risk of being stolen as they walked in with their helmets off. Their new capes flowing behind them as high above Magrika and Jasper both waited for their signal. The small tent and lean-to city has nearly a hundred small fires already burning in the early evening, and there's a bit of gagging at the sheer stench of what food they could get half-rotting as smoking is a tricky thing to do. Open shit pits and the stink of some girls trying to get some kind of tannery going. Being drafted for the army and then thrown away when the neighboring nation failed to be provoked left a lot of girls untrained and pissed. They were recognized and no one stopped them as they went to find the lady's tent. It was in the middle of everything and slightly elevated as she preferred, which had led the woman to several bad nights of sleep in the past and had given everyone a bad day. Sleeping on an incline is no fun. The hell is going on? The familiar voice roars and from out of the fur-covered dome and stomps out. Araminta, like everyone else in this army, turned bandit clan. She seems to drink in the light around her and knows enough about her axiom use to be an absolute horror in battle. Who the hell are you, and why haven't you... Wait, you're Arumenta too. You're too clean to be one of us. Who are you? Actually, Lena begins as the rest of the girls step to the side into a semicircle. We were, but he intervened. He? The lady asks just before Jasper slams into the middle of the semicircle, and a shockwave rocks out and up the hill to blow her backwards and rattles half the camp awake no problem. The bang is loud enough that everyone comes running to see what's next. Who the hell are you? She screams out in a fury as Jasper unfolds and rises up and up and up. The past week had seen him grow massively. All the food, all the power he kept drawing from the area around him had his entire physiology shift until he resembled no Earthani to ever step foot on Lacron, tightless or otherwise. He's broad of shoulder with thick arms and legs and unnaturally tall by Earthani standards. Jasper has physically shifted himself from the slight, frail frame of most of his kind have into a clear powerhouse. Straps of bronze riveted to his leather vest. His arms are almost completely free with heavy gauntlets to aid in his punches. His legs are heavy armored and from his thighs are a pair of massive swords sunken into expanded sheaths so that he may carry the large weapons without tripping over them. There's a pause as the lady takes in the sheer presence then notices the matching capes. So, the Star Seekers have you are Lady Dusk, disgraced noblewoman of Miru and former leader of this raggedy band of would-be warriors, Jasper asks in a booming, carrying tone. Former? Who the hell are you? Lady Dusk demands, and Jasper smirks at her. I am Jasper Blue, sergeant of the undaunted, martial master of the Order of Star Seekers, and now the leader of this band of soon-to-be warriors. Excuse me! Lady Dusk screeches in rage. You're excused, Jasper says smugly as Magrika slowly lowers down from the sky. Clearly she hates the stink of the place and has nothing good to say about it at all. But she lands on his shoulder regardless and slides down with a spin to saunter off behind him. 
Lady Dusk is clearly out of patience as she charges down at Jasper and receives a brutal backhand that carries her into her tent. Try it with an actual weapon, you idiot. Jasper calls to her as most of the clan seems paralyzed and unsure of what to do. There's only a pause and Lady Dusk emerges with an enormous mace and fire in her eyes. Much better. Now then, fool who has led these women to desperation and doom, let us do battle. He states loudly as he slowly pulls out the massive blades that are just a little shorter than him. He had personally shaped them from crude iron pulled out of a nearby mine. They were big, scary, and in the flamberge style for both a sense of the exotic and an extra advantage. What do you want? Lady Dusk asks her clear intent to charge suddenly dulled by the massive swords easily held in Jasper's hands. The clan, all of it. You have been harassing the Order of the Star Seekers and they have sent me to deal with you as I see fit. While most would content themselves in baseless slaughter, I instead see potential. Potential to turn this sad band of dying miscreants into actual warriors. I have already taken six of your number and molded them into greater things. I offer such training, such equipment, and such possibilities for all of you. A time of great change is approaching. Will you be swept away in the tides of change? Or will you rise to the occasion and ride the wave to glory? Jasper announces, remembering the quick and dirty speech lessons on what to say and how to say it. He had to look both larger than life and mundane at once. He had to be someone they could see as one of their own and as a figure they could believe in. He needed both style and substance. So he cribbed his notes from fantasy warlords and dark sorcerers after asking some nerd squad for advice. They almost talked him into introducing himself as the Dragmire. Magrika had thought the whole thing was nothing short of hilarious especially when she had been told that her going around and basically leaning on him all the time was the best way she could to present herself. Thankfully, she was already down for basically always cuddling up against him, even when he was being as loud and as boisterous as possible. Glory? You think you can just... Lady Dusk demands with her face contorting in fury, and she slams the massive two-handed mace into the ground. Where was the glory when we were abandoned by our duchess? Where was the glory when we were sent to die at the slightest hint of inconvenience? I hadn't arrived yet, Jasper says. And you think your glory itself? She screams at him in rage. For you and yours? Yes. Jasper responds deliberately, provoking her into a berserker fury, and she charges him with the mace held high. He plants his two swords into the ground and steps forward, cape snapping in a wind that touches him and him alone, and catches the head of the mace in the palm of his left hand. You have been betrayed, Jasper says, pushing her back with his left hand alone. She skids along the ground, her feet digging into the already churned up earth, but her boots have nothing on the fact that he's actually grabbing the ground with his foot claws and pushing forwards. You have been abandoned. Shut up. You were cast aside by the corrupt and the stupid to die of sickness and starvation. You were all the young daughters of city folk and torn from your homes, taught how to put on armor and then cast aside before anything else could occur. I offer to complete your training. Silence. Lady Dusk is almost rabid as she tries to regain control of her mace but Jasper's claws have dug into the metal and the only way she's getting it back is in pieces or with his help. I offer to feed and house you, he continues. You what? That one threw her off. I offer honor and glory in a true and just cause, Jasper declares. I do not ask for your lives. I ask for loyalty to be returned. Stand with me, not against me, and I will make you stronger. I will teach you so that even if you choose to leave my service later, you may thrive in these wilds in which you now barely survive within. Why? Lady Dusk asks in shock. A drowning soul offered the hand of salvation from an unexpected direction. This world is bleeding breaking under its own weight. What happened to you was a crime, a tragedy. I am undaunted. 
There is no challenge I cannot conquer. I will save this world and I'm starting with you, Jasper says, and she stares at him. Will you come with me? She stares at his offered hand before looking to see that he still has her mace firmly gripped and thoroughly stopped in the other one. Her mind is whirring and churning. He can see the gears grinding behind her eyes and it's all he can do to not smirk as he sees her come to her decision. A blaring low horn sounds out over the distance and comes from the west, from the direction of the Miru border. That's... Lady Dusk does not finish the phrase. Magrika, can you take a look, my love? Jasper asks the Metak warrior who launches into the sky with ease and circles around before shooting down. Miru army, their flags are red over green. Slaughter banners, they're here to kill. Lady Dusk says in flat terror and Jasper pats her on the shoulder. Not today they're not. Today they fail. 